Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, it's now uh, my distinguished, distinguished, it's a, it's a great honor to welcome uh, Dr. Mitesh Patel from the University of Pennsylvania uh, to be our afternoon keynote speaker. Uh, Dr. Patel presented to our group uh, yesterday, our health services research group, about the work that he's doing at the University of Pennsylvania with the Penn Medicine uh, Nudge Unit, which is fascinating. And he'll be talking more this afternoon, a different presentation about his work in uh, behavioral economics. Uh, Dr. Patel is a graduate of the University of Michigan for undergraduate in medical school, and then he did his uh, internship and residency in internal medicine. Uh, fellowship, or it was Robert Wood Johnson uh, Fellow at the University of Pennsylvania, and also did an uh, MBA at the Wharton School. Um, it's, uh, I'm not going to take up too much of his time because he also has a, a uh, car to take him back to the airport. Um, Dr. Patel will be talking till about 3.15 or, or so, and then answering questions. And um, so without further ado, Dr. Mitesh Patel. Thank you, Bruce, for that warm introduction. Um, glad to be here and um, excited to present some of the work from our group um, to you guys. Um, uh, as Bruce mentioned, I'm a general internist by training, but I spend most of my time doing research running clinical trials. Uh, I'm going to present kind of our framework on how we think about um, changing behavior by using wearable devices and other types of wearable, wear, wireless technologies. Um, and then we'll uh, talk about a framework for using behavioral economics to enhance those approaches. And then we'll share some of the results from our early clinical trials, so three trials looking at financial incentives, um, and then talk about how we're using those insights to launch um, new studies in, in, the realms, in the same realm using social incentives. So before I start, I just want to see a, a show of hands. How many people are wearing a wearable device right now? So maybe 25% of the people here. Um, so, you know, you, th you would think that if you were at a health and technology conference, that would be the place to find people wearing wearable devices. But as we know, you know, not a lot of people use these things. Many people are excited by these because for the first time, many large technology companies are starting, into, starting to get into the space of population health. Apple, Google, Samsung, and others um, have come out with newer devices over the last few years. Despite that, it's estimated that only about 1% to 2% of the general population has a wearable device and is continuing to use it. Um, still, it's estimated that the sales of these devices will continue to increase over time. Many people are looking towards these devices to solve what we call the 5,000-hour problem. And that is the idea that the average patient, even if you have a chronic condition like COPD or diabetes, you spend no more than a few hours with a healthcare professional, a physician or nurse um, in the clinic. But you spend in more than 5,000 hours awake doing everything else in your daily lives, whether that's deciding what you're going to have for dinner or dessert, uh, whether or not you're going to exercise or go to the gym today, and if you're on medications, whether or not you're going to continue to take them or remember to take them. Uh, because of this fact, many people have come to realize that health behaviors play a significant um, contrib contributing role to our health. So it's estimated, and there are various estimates out there, but it's estimated here that 40% of uh, our contribution to premature death is related to our behavioral patterns. And we can debate exactly what this number is, but none needless to say that this is a large proportion of what determines our health over time. Our current model of care is not sufficient for this. It's reactive and visit-based. We wait until patients get sick, and then most of our resources are uh, focused on when they go into the healthcare setting, um, and we're trying to treat those conditions. What's needed is a new model of care that is more proactive, that where the consumer is engaged in their health, where we're able to identify um, red flags and risks before they happen and able to then intervene within the patient's daily lives. That is not within the clinic in front of the physician, but at home, um, at work, and, and where they spend most of their time. So there are three evolving market trends that really push us towards a dynamic where we can do this. The first is that innovations in mobile technology really, really allow us to touch people within their everyday lives. Uh, almost 70% of people in the United States have a smartphone. If I were to venture to guess, I would bet that most of you here have a smartphone. Um, mobile devices and uh, wearable devices and others are starting to increase in popularity. Um, so this gives us a new uh, way to touch people. 
our understanding of how to motivate people has really changed, and that's driven in the last decade by uh, the field of behavioral economics, which I'm going to spend some time talking about today. And then for the first time, healthcare financing is shifting focus from a focus on volume to a focus on value. And with that, we can be, begin to think about how hospitals and healthcare systems might not only think about how we treat patients when they're within the four walls of the clinic or the hospital, but how we might uh, help them improve their health when they're at home. So the hope for wearable devices is that these devices can educate and motivate individuals towards better habits and better health. But there's quite a bit of concern that most of the evidence thus far has suggested that for the people that really need to change their behavior the most, that is the people that are not engaged in their health, um, that are overweight, obese, or have a chronic condition, that these devices alone are not enough. If you're someone that goes to the gym regularly, you're already engaged in your health, you're a quote unquote quantified selfer, these devices can be great for you. They can help to tailor what you're doing. But for the majority of the patients that we see going in and out of the hospital all the time, um, these devices alone are not good enough. So there are really four key challenges um, that we think need to be addressed for wearable devices to make an impact at the population level. The first is access. As I mentioned, the individuals that need these devices the most are not the ones that are using them. Only 25% of people at a health and technology conference even have a wearable device. Most people are younger, more tech savvy, more engaged in their health, and more affluent. They're not the patients with chronic conditions. So what are the methods by which we could get this into the hands of people that need it most? Well, some of this is going to be evolving, but some early signs of this have been through workplace wellness programs. So companies like Fitbit, Comcast, and others have decided that they're going to be giving wearable devices to all of their employees. So here's an uh, article from Bloomberg um, from about six months ago where Target announced that they're going to be giving 335,000 employees wearable devices that they can use to monitor step goals and participate in step goal competitions. For the first time, a large insurer has announced that they're going to be subsidizing wearable devices. Aetna is giving these devices um, to, most of, to all of their employees and then subsidizing them for their members. There have been small startup health insurance companies that have been doing this, like Oscar Health with Misfit Wearables, um, but this is the first large insurer that's announced that they're going to be doing this. So let's say you've, given, you've got an individual um, a device. Now comes the next challenge, which is how do you get them to keep using that device? About half of people that purchase a wearable device stop using it within a couple of months. And given the way that the technology around these devices are designed, it, it's not uh, hard to see why. You're taking individuals who are raising their hand and they're saying, I have a hard time changing behavior, I'm overweight or obese, I, I have a problem going to the gym and so on, and you're asking them not only to be more physically active, to lose more weight, but you're asking them to do a variety of things that are involved with using these technologies. Many individuals, have, you have to wear these devices every day, that's a new behavior because you weren't doing that before. Most of these devices regard, need to be regularly charged, some of them every day, and that's a, a new behavior that you have to add. In order to do anything with this data, you need to use another device. You either need to sync the wearable device with your smartphone, or you need to plug it into a computer, and then you have to make sure you can understand whatever feedback it's giving you to be able to do something with it. So it's not surprising that these extra steps on top of the behavior that you're already trying to change add up to high hurdles for these people that, be, that start with a lower level of motivation and engagement. It's not, you know, activity trackers have been around for decades. Wearable devices may seem new, um, but these technologies have been around. So pedometers have been around for a long time. The behavior here is that individuals actively carry these things on their waistband or in their pockets. The cost is relatively cheap, cheap, 10 to $50, but the effort is a little bit higher. Uh, studies have shown that in order to change your behavior with a pedometer, you've got to have a step goal and keep a step diary. Oftentimes, people do this by hand. And the adoption rate is low. Less than 1% of the population walks around regularly with a pedometer. Wearable devices are slightly different. The behavior here is that they're, you're actively wearing these devices. They're more um, consumer-focused, fashionable, um, but, but they're much more expensive. Some of the effort here is reduced, but you still have to do some of the things that I mentioned in terms of charging, wearing these, and actively syncing them. And the adoption rate here is also low. More than 70% of people in the United States have a smartphone and carry it with them most places that they go. The, the behavior here is not that you're actively doing anything for your health, it's that you're passively carrying these devices for your health. You're actively using them to be able to check your email, text your friends, look at your calendar, and so on, but these devices can be used to track your everyday behaviors. If you've got a smartphone, then the, the applications to be able to do this are free, and you can download them in a couple of minutes. 
the effort here is much lower. There's a lot less friction because we can pull this data passively through a cellular connection and then send you back prompts or information or nudges without you having to actively sync anything. And as I mentioned, the adoption rate here is quite high. So Apple has taken advantage of this. If you have an iPhone, it's tracking your steps all the time. You actually can't turn this function off. You can turn the display off, but you can't, uh, you can't turn the tracking of this information off. They've made this the default on all of their phones. Um, Apple has been working with a variety of folks and developed HealthKit to be able to integrate this within health systems. Um, here's a snapshot uh, of the integration at Penn Medicine with Epic. Penn was one of the first partners with Apple HealthKit. Um, as a physician, you can actually prescribe, track steps, track weight, track blood pressure, and if patients have an Apple device and a device that does these things, this goes right into the Epic flow sheet so that the provider can review them if they want. Now what they're going to do with this, we don't know yet. We have a couple of clinical trials testing different ways to um, send this to physicians or not um, that I'm going to be talking about later in the talk. So let's say you've got the, per the person who needs a device with a device. You figured out a way to make the technology so that's low friction so that people can sustain its use. Now comes the next challenge, which is whether or not these devices are accurately tracking or doing whatever they say they're doing. Um, there are lots of different devices. The number of devices has grown. This is from two years ago from a snapshot from Rock Health of, a, the, dif uh, of the different devices that are available, and there's now many more of these there. Um, and the challenge is essentially none of these were really well validated, very few of them. The ones that have been have been mostly in the research context and are not the popular devices that most people are using. So we did one of the first studies um, looking to evaluate the accuracy of popular wearable devices and smartphone apps for tracking step counts. Um, so what we did was we asked people on campus to come to a gym and go through four different walking trials on a treadmill. Um, two shorter trials of 500 steps each and two longer trials of 1,500 steps each. We had a medical student who stood there and watched and counted with a counter each of these steps so we knew exactly how many steps they walked. And then we asked each participant to wear a bunch of devices. So on their hip, they used the SW20 DigiWalker, which is a gold standard pedometer used and well validated in research. The Fitbit One and the Fitbit Zip, which were the most popular accelerometers at that time, on their waistband. On their wrist, they wore the Fitbit Flex, the Jawbone Up, and the Nike Fuel Band, which were the most popular selling wearable devices at the time of the study. In their right pants pocket, we put an iPhone running the three most popular uh, apps for tracking steps, Wythings, Fitbit, and Moves. And in their left pants pocket, we put an Android running the only device at that time that could track steps on an Android, which was the Moves app. Uh, we had them get on, walk 500 steps, get off, log what each of the devices said, walk 500 steps, then walk 15 and, and 15 again. Um, uh, and the medical student, as I mentioned, counted these steps. We repeated this about 550 times, and this is what we found. So moving from the bottom up, we see that at the bottom, the, the pedometers and the accelerometers are, are quite accurate and precise. The dots are the means, and the bars are the sta one standard deviation above and below the mean. But as we move up to the wearable devices, we start to see quite a bit of variation. Specifically in the Nike fuel band, was a, about, on average, was about 22% below the mean. Um, what was surprising in this study was that the smartphone, uh, smartphones, which two-thirds of Americans carry with them everywhere they go, were just as accurate as wearable devices and actually uh, had a little bit more precision um, in terms of less variability around the mean. We repeated this for the longer step trial, 1,500 steps, um, and found the same thing. So again, the Nike Fuel Band was the only one that underperformed. So our general takeaway was that most of these devices were actually fairly accurate with the exception of one, um, but that more, val more studies like this should be done to, so that we can figure out what can be appropriate for people to accurately track their, th track their behaviors. Now, this was one of the first studies done. It's not surprising that these things can be impactful. We don't focus our time on these types of studies. We, we spend most of our time on using these devices for behavior change. But it's not surprising that a week after the study was published, there were major changes at Nike. So I, I think these plans were already in place, but this may have accelerated things. Uh, I actually had a Nike fuel band way back when, and I didn't know that I could have gotten $25 um, to use for a future device because of this. But at the bottom, I don't know if you can see this, but they, they quoted the study saying fitness devices that use these sensors and algorithms are often um, not accurate enough to produce reliable data. 
So there have been other studies, I won't spend too much time talking about these, but by other groups doing similar things, comparing controlled and um, live uh, and in free, free, work, free living days for energy activity. Um, there was a recent study in JAMA Cardiology looking at the accuracy of these devices on the wrist to track heart rate, um, and they find quite a bit of variability. So we, we really think that more of this type of work needs to be done. So let's say you've got the person who needs a device to have a wearable device. You've figured out a way to leverage technology that will reduce friction from continuing to do that. And you know that whatever you're tracking is accurate. Now comes the hardest step. How do you motivate these individuals to actually use these devices to change their behaviors, to be more physically active, to lose weight, to take medicines, to better manage their diabetes? This is quite a challenge. We re heavily rely on uh, the, the evolution of the science of motivation. The you know, older forms of motivation or the standard approach has been that if we just tell people um, what they need to do, that they'll change their behavior, that people are not aware and we just need to make them aware. But we know this often doesn't work. We know that people who smoke know that it's bad for them and causes cancer, yet they have a hard time changing. We know that people who don't go to the gym regularly know they should. Standard economics says, well, why don't we use an incentive to motivate people? And if, it's, if an incentive doesn't work, well, people act rationally. So if we increase the size or the magnitude of the incentive, they should then change their behavior. We just need to pay them more to do this. But behavioral economics takes a different approach. It, it understands that people act irrationally, but a pro, pro, in a, from a predictable set of ways and a common set of decision errors. And that actually the design and delivery of incentives is oftentimes more important than the magnitude of the incentives itself. Now this field has gotten a boost from healthcare reform. Um, the old um, rules around how much of your health insurance premiums could be used for these types of things were actually under HIPAA, which people don't think of as being focused on rewarding incentives, but it conditioned that 20% of premiums could be used for incentives for health factors, things like BMI, blood pressure, LDL. Um, under the Affordable Care Act, beginning in 2014, employers could use anywhere from 30 to as high as 50% of health insurance premiums um, for people that were uh, you know, focused on these health factors. Now, if you think about the typical person with a $10,000 health insurance premium, this means that they can use um, three to $5,000 um, as incentives, either as rewards for changing your behavior or as punishments for not changing your behavior or not achieving your goals. Even before these, these new boosts to the incentives and the stimulus went into place, um, there was a large proportion of employers that were using these types of things. So from 2009 to 2013 in the blue, this is the percent of large employers that are offering incentives for health promotion. This increased from about 55% upwards towards 90%. The average amount that they were spending concurrently, even before the stimulus, had doubled from about 250 to close to 550 and now is uh, above $700 per employee per year that employers are spending on these types of incentives. So with all of this spending and all of this effort, what's the evidence that these workplace wellness programs work? Well, it's not very strong. Most of these programs are based on standard economics, um, and we think that, that that's a challenge, and so we're hoping some of this work can help us to figure out how do we advance the science of motivation and actually make it applicable within these settings. So I'm gonna talk about a framework from behavioral economics and go through some of the common decision errors that we see, and then I'll show you some examples of how we use these types of interventions um, to help people change behavior. So the first is default bias. Um, this has been most uh, well known as an example is in organ donor status. This is uh, the organ donor consent rate in Western European countries. Now the countries on the left in the kind of the tan bars are the ones where they have opt-in systems. This is similar to the United States where you have to say that I want to be an organ donor. And you can see those rates are quite low, anywhere from five to 25%. But in the opt-out countries, these are countries where by default you're an organ donor and you can say that you don't want to be and you have to take steps to do that, the rates are much higher, many of them near 99%. So we tested something similar at the University of Pennsylvania Health System. We first did a pilot looking at how to change defaults for generic medications and then rolled it out across the entire health system. Shown here on the x-axis is time and the y-axis is the percent of medications prescribed as generic. Each line is a medication. These are the top 50 most frequently prescribed medications that have generics available um, at our health system. And you can see a couple of things. There's wide variation. Some of, the, some of these medications are prescribed nearly always as generic. Other ones are lower down. They're about 20%. Um, but that you can see within any given uh, line that they're fairly steady. So a line that's around 50 to 60% essentially stays there. 
So in November 2014, we changed this. So by default, whether you were prescribing Coreg, a brand name prescription, or Carvedilol, a default, a uh, generic prescription, um, it defaulted to the generic unless you clicked a box that said dispense as written, which is something that's existed in pharmacy pads for years, but not in electronic health records. And this is what happened. Essentially, overnight, uh, almost every medicine um, went to 99% generic, saving both patients and the health system money. Now, you can see that's with the exception of one medication, which went up to about 80% but stayed there. And this medication illustrates an important point. So this is um, levothyroxine and Synthroid. So if many, some of you may know this, but the manufacturing between the brand and the generic are not as well controlled. And so if you're on the brand name prescription of Synthroid uh, for hypothyroidism and you switch to the generic, you actually may need to retitrate your dose. That can take months, multiple blood draws. And so patients who are hard to control and are on the brand, physicians often want to keep them on the brand. So what this study illustrates is that defaults can be very powerful. Um, this cost essentially nothing. They just spent about a couple of hours to change the way that the choice architecture was done. But that in options where we want physicians or clinicians or whoever the decision maker is to opt out, we can do that. Um, and they were doing that here in the case of Synthroid and Levothyroxine. So the next concept is this idea of self-control and immediate gratification. And this is best illustrated by a series of studies that were done um, at Stanford in the 1960s. How many people have heard of the marshmallow test? So a couple of people. So this is a popular thing. If you haven't seen the YouTube video of this, I highly recommend going to, going to see it. So what they did was they took um, uh, kids and they put them in a room and they gave them one marshmallow and they told them that they, if they waited for them to come back, that they would give them two marshmallows. So it was a test of self-control. Could you wait to see uh, if you would get two marshmallows instead of one? And then they went behind a, uh, you know, a, a, a mirror and that they could see through and they watched these kids to see what they would do. And this is what they saw. After a while, these kids would try to do all kinds of things. Some of them would, would try to cover their eyes, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Some of them would put the marshmallow under the table. But then eventually, um, kids would just pop them into their mouths. And, and so what they found was that, that uh, this is a ways to measure self-control. What was more interesting than this study itself was the follow-up study that they did about 20 years later when they went back and they looked at these children. And what they found was the ones that could wait longer, the ones that could hold out, the ones that had more self-control were more likely to have higher IQs, were more likely to be rated by their friends and family members as organized, structured, um, and had better health and health outcomes um, than the ones that had less. And so it really tells us about how our self-control can play an important part in our lives and our health. The next idea is overweighting small probabilities. And uh, I don't have to tell you guys about this. There are state lotteries that the United States we, makes about $150 billion at the state level per year from these state lotteries um, because people really think that they can win. Um, uh, $70 billion now, $150 billion. Um, the, the odds of winning this has gone down significantly. So you can see just here from 1992 to 2012, the odds of this lottery uh, in one state went from 1 in 55 million to 1 in 175 million, um, which is quite dramatic, but is not really perceptible by the individual person who's just buying a lottery ticket. So we can leverage this in interventions. The other concept we can leverage is loss aversion. So people, this is the idea based off of prospect theory that people tend to be more motivated by the opportunity to lose things than the, than the benefit they feel from gaining them. So an example might be um, if I gave you $5 um, and you might think, oh great, I can go and buy a cup of coffee from Starbucks. But if I were to ask you to give me $5 out of your wallet, you might have a hard time giving up with that, with that money because you feel a sense like it's yours. It's something that you already had. You already had plans to use that $5 for something. Um, and now you have to give it up. There's all kinds of information, not only in the, the field of self-monitoring, but um, throughout other things like calorie displays and so on. Um, and the way we frame this information really has impacts on how people perceive it and how salient it is towards the action that we're doing. So um, the calorie count labeling has rolled out nationally, um, first started at a couple of places. And if anything, we've, uh, the evidence has been mixed, but show that people who are lower incomes actually uh, purchase more calories because they see it as more value for the dollar that they're spending. But there are simple ways, and some of the folks from earlier today have um, talked about studies looking at these things, that we can label these things to help these more obvious, so that we can understand what 0.9 grams of sugar is or what 10.8 grams of saturated fat are. There's this idea of anticipated regret, which is when you can anticipate losing the reward from the future. One of the uh, places where this is done best um, is uh, Publishers Clearinghouse, where they used to 
um, go around um, and tell people, you know, enter today and every day because you never know when you could be the next winner. And to make this more salient, they would take um, th popular TV things like the Super Bowl and go up to people's houses afterwards and show a family just like your family um, who they're knocking on the door. It's a big surprise. Here's a huge check so that you feel like it's something that you could win. And these are ways that we can use emotions to help drive people's behavior. And the last concept I'll talk about is this idea of social norms. Um, the best way to, uh, one example of highlighting this is from this study in California on neighborhood energy consumption. What they did was they went around to people in the neighborhood and they took these tags similar to kind of the, the do not disturb signs that you might see at a hotel and they put them on people's doors and they showed them how much energy they used in the last month and what was the average that was used by their neighbors with the idea being that people who are using more energy than their neighbors would, use, would realize that and use less um, and we could hopefully move down this average. And this is what they found. They found that people indeed who are above average, which is the dark gray bar, use less energy. But what they also found was that people who are using less energy realized that they were using less energy on average, and so they increased their energy consumption. And there was a quote unquote regression to the mean here. And so you can see how if these things are not well designed, they can have unanticipated regrets. But these researchers did something clever, was that, which was that they randomly assigned half of the households in the neighborhood to get the intervention that I described to you. The other half of the neighborhood, the other half of the households got um, the same intervention but with a small twist, with what we call an injunctive norm, which is to tell it's a social approval or disapproval. Uh, so if someone was uh, spending, using less energy than average, a way to say, good job, great, and people who were doing more than that to show them of the disapproval. And the way they did that was very simple. They put a smiley face on people who are using less energy than their peers and a frown face on people that were using higher energy. And the results were significantly different. So people who were above average decreased their energy consumption by more with the uh, frowny face, and people who were above, below average actually had no statistical change um, from before if they had the social approval. So it really shows us that uh, when we implement these things, we have to think about the design and how we might do that. So just to review the different ways that, the different things that we've talked about and ways we can use them, we can change the path of least resistance for things we know are, are, are most optimal. We can make awards immediate and frequent. We can use variable awards by lo using lotteries to help sustain behavior. We can put rewards at risk so that people are at risk of losing them if they don't achieve the behavior. Thinking about how to make rewards tangible and in a familiar context. And then leveraging regret aversion. So we tell individuals what they would have won had they only um, changed their behavior or been adherent. So here are some examples. The first example I'll give you is um, from one of my colleagues, uh, one of the classic studies in this. And the way we did, we've done that and a lot of these other studies is by using uh, uh, this technology at, at Penn we call Way to Health. It's an automated uh, platform where people can sign up online. Um, and the idea here is that participants can either use a device they have or we'll mail that to them. This could be a wearable device, a wireless weight scale, a connected pill bottle. That data is transmitted to our servers on, on a daily basis. Um, the, that's, the servers then check whether or not they met their personalized goal, um, depending on what arm they are in the study or the program, whether they're eligible for a reward or some type of feedback. If so, that lottery or uh, reward is won. If they get something, they can choose whether they want their feedback by email, text message, or automated voice. Um, and this information is automatically sent back to them. And then the funds are sent to them either through a bank card or through a check in the mail. All of this is done by an automated platform. So it gives us the ability to reach people all across the United States um, with only a couple of people. So it's much less personnel intensive and it can be used to really scale interventions much more broadly. Um, and so we've used this platform to enroll people in over 47 states in the US. Um, so let me give you an example of how the lottery design works and I'll show you an example of how this has been used for weight loss. So the idea here is that there are variable rewards and there's immediate gratification. So the lottery runs every day and you have about a one in five chance of winning five dollars and a one in a hundred chance of winning uh, fifty dollars. Mathematically this comes out to about a dollar forty per day or about five hundred and fifty dollars per year. The way we operationalize this is by asking you, the individual who's in the study, to pick a lottery number. It makes the lottery more real um, and, and helps us to keep people engaged in this. So let's say you pick the number 42. Every day we run the lottery. Whether or not you uh, checked in and, and, and weighed in or, or uh, synced your data or whatever it was. So let's say the, the winning number today was 47. You have a one digit match. You match the four. There's about a one in five chance that you'll do that. Tomorrow the winning number might be 32 and your number is 42. There's a one digit match with the two. So that's about a one in five chance. You win $5. And 
given the odds, you should win about every week. So it keeps people engaged by, by doing that. But there's also this uh, higher level um, uh, chance of winning, 100, uh, winning $50. So if your number is 42 and uh, one in 100 chance of matching that is the winning number being 42, um, then you win the $50. You can go into the portal and change your uh, lottery number anytime you want. But then what's important is how we take that information and frame it to people uh, to help build anticipated regret. So let's say you met your weight loss goal and you won the lottery. You might get a text message like this. Congratulations, you met your weight goal yesterday and won $5 in today's lottery. Weigh in every day to be eligible. Tomorrow you could be a winner. But what if you uh, did not weigh in but won the lottery? You could get a message like this. Congratulations, you won $50. However, you didn't meet your weight goal yesterday, so you're not eligible to collect the reward. <laughs> weigh in tomorrow and you could be a winner. So you can see how individuals who get this type of feedback might start to anticipate the regret of tomorrow's lottery. It's going to run whether or not you weigh in or not, whether or not you meet your goal, and you could miss out on money that you should win. So it, it starts to motivate people to change their behavior. Maybe I'll go to the gym tonight. Maybe I'll skip out on dessert because I'm anticipating the regret of, tomorrow, of missing out on tomorrow's reward. Um, so one of the first studies trying this was a, a, a small trial at the Philadelphia VA with 57 participants that were randomized to a 16-week weight loss study where they were asked to lose one pound per week. Um, and it compared a control arm um, versus a lottery incentive. The magnitude was double what I just showed you, so it was a 1 in 5 chance of $10 or a 1 in 100 chance of $100, so close to $3 per day. Or a deposit contract where you as a, the individual could put in anywhere from a penny to $3 um, if you didn't meet your goal, you lost the money you put down. It's a way of getting skin in the game. But if you met your goal, you get your money back plus an extra $3. This is what they found after 16 weeks. So the control arm lost about four pounds, but the lottery and deposit contract were significantly more, anywhere from 12 to 14 pounds of weight loss. So this really demonstrated that these interventions can be used um, to, to help implement behavioral economic uh, approaches to for behavior change. So how have we used these um, thinking about people's activity in some of these new studies? So one study that we did recently was looking at framing financial incentives to increase physical activity. So we asked people, we, asked, uh, we had about 280 people randomized to one of four arms. Uh, to be in the trial, you uh, had to have a BMI of at least 27. The average BMI was actually closer to 33. So this was an overweight and uh, obese population. Um, we asked people to strive to achieve a step goal of 7,000 steps. Most step goals are usually framed around 10,000 steps, which is twice the national average of 5,000. Um, and, and the evidence has shown that most people who engage in these programs tend to be the ones that are already walking around 8,000 steps. So our goal here was to target a sedentary population and to try to get everyone above a minimum level. The American College of Sports Medicine has also um, supported the notion that at least 7,000 steps is where you start to attain some of the health benefits. Um, that you can get. Obviously more is better, but we wanted to try to get everyone above a minimum. So we randomized people to a control arm where they got a text, email, or voice call with daily feedback. So this would be your typical self-monitoring arm where you're told, congrats, you met your step goal, or sorry, you didn't. Or one of three incentive arms. In each of the incentive arms, you're given an opportunity to, earn, to win about $1.40 per day. All three of the arms were paid at the end of the month by check. And you're told that up front. So you knew the money was delivered the same way at the same time but we frame the incentive differently. So in the standard gain framing arm, this is the typical approach that we see out there in the industry, you're told that if you achieve your step goal, that you'll earn $1.40 per day. So you do a certain behavior and you get paid for it. In the lottery arm, we use the lottery that I described to you, the one in five chance of $5 and the one in 100 chance of 50, which is mathematically over the course of a month about $1.40 per day. And then we had a loss framing arm where we told individuals on the first day of each month for three months that $42 has put, been put in a virtual account with your name on it. Each day you meet your goal, you keep that money. But each day you don't meet your goal, $1.40 is taken away from you. Now keep in mind, at the, end of the, at the end of the month, if you met your goal on 10 days in each of these arms, you will get paid $14 uh, on average between these two. All we did was change the way we framed these. So the results were quite dramatic. So in the control arm, this is just your, your self-monitoring. You get feedback. Um, participants achieve the goal about 30% of the time, which is quite low, but this is a sedentary population. Um, so we think by the uh, BMI criteria. In the gain incentive arm, it was a little higher. They achieved the goal about 35% of the time, but statistically no different from not paying them at all. In the lottery arm, it was a little bit higher, 36%. 
Um, but the, the most significant effect that we saw was in the loss incentive arm, which was significantly different from the control arm and on a relative basis meant that people were achieving their physical activity goals about 50% more of the time. And so you can see how just the way that we frame incentives can really have a dramatic impact on how people behave. So about a week after we published this study, the Vitality Group, which is a large um, wellness program um, globally, um, but very heavy here in the United States, announced the, this program that, they were, that they're launching where they're giving all of their employees an Apple Watch for $25, um, but noted that there's a catch, which is that if uh, they meet monthly fitness goals over two years, uh, then that's great. But if they don't, if they meet none of the goals, then they'll actually pay back the entire cost of the Apple Watch. So this is a great way to be able to implement loss aversion at scale by giving someone a device for this and then having them pay it back over time um, if they don't meet their goals. So we're testing this in a uh, higher risk patient population. So the study I described uh, to you was looking at uh, overweight and obese patients. Um, for this study, we're using the Misfit Shine, which requires no charging for up to six months. It's waterproof, so you don't have to take it off in the shower. We ask people to wear it all the time and we track both your, your step counts and your sleep patterns. Um, and the idea here is that we have 105 patients that are enrolled in this. All of these patients had a heart attack recently, and we enrolled them um, soon after the heart attack. Um, the, the reason we're interested in this population is that we know that cardiac rehab is good for patients that have heart attacks, um, but only about 20% of patients that have a heart attack actually enroll in cardiac rehab. So we wanted to test whether or not we could create a home-based cardiac rehab program using incentives and wearable devices. So the control arm gets a wearable device, establishes a baseline, and then just uses it for six months to track their behavior. The intervention arm gets a personalized step goal based off of um, what their uh, baseline was, where it slowly increases over the course of 16 weeks. They get $14 allocated in a virtual account each month, and then they lose $2 each day that the goal is not achieved. Um, so this study is currently in the field, but we're excited to see um, if this can be implemented in a higher risk population and then um, how this has impacts for future study design. Another area where people are really interested around wearable technology and smartphones is making these uh, things more social. So how can we do this in teams and have step competitions and so on? We see a lot of workplaces doing this and trying to offer incentives along with these competitions. But there hasn't been much evidence on the best way to do this. Um, so we did a study where we had a drawing every other day um, and we asked, and we asked, uh, so team, what we did was we worked with Independence Blue Cross. They had about 304 individuals in this study, randomized to one of four arms. They chose teams of four members, and you could pick your teams. We wanted people to pick team members that they knew. Everybody was in the same building, and so um, you could see that people were competing and trying to, trying to make sure that they stayed active. Every other day we had a, a drawing, and if your team was chosen as the winner, everybody on your team got $50. Um, now, mathematically, over time, this comes out to about $1.40 per day, given the odds, so it's equivalent to the last study. But whether or not you got $50 varied. There's a control arm where you don't get an incentive and you just get feedback. The individual incentive arm, if your team uh, got chosen as the winner, you got $50 if you met your step goal on the previous day, your 7,000 step goal, so just whether or not you met it. We see a lot of people looking at team-based incentives. So in this arm, if you, your team got chosen as the winner, everybody got $50 on your team, but only if all four people achieved the step goal. If even one person didn't achieve their step goal, the entire team did not get their $50. So you can see how if you were on this, in this arm, you would be really looking and trying to make sure that your other teammates were staying active. And then there was a combined incentive. And in this arm, we tried to balance the individual um, rewards with the social reinforcement. So if your team got chosen as the winner, you got $20 if you yourself achieved the goal, and then you got a $10 bonus if each of your teammates did. So still an opportunity to win up to $50 in this arm. So here's what we found. In the control arm, where you just got daily feedback on whether or not you achieved your goal, um, people met the goal about 18% of the time. So this is a sedentary population. Um, uh, most people sat at their desks all day during work, so quite low. In the individual incentive, it was a little bit higher, about 25%, but um, with this sample size, not statistically different than not getting paid at all. The team incentive actually did a little bit worse, 17% of the time. And in fact, in the entire study, over three months, no team was ever chosen as the winner and actually got to collect the reward. There was always one person who didn't meet their step goal. And that, you know, it's not surprising why this arm didn't do as well. 
But the combined incentive, which was much different, actually a 95% relative increase, almost double the proportion of time that people met their step goals at about 35%. So you can see that the same in incentive um, used, with so used with social reinforcement can be delivered and designed differently and have a dramatically different impact on people's outcomes. So in the last financial incentive study that I'll tell you about, we looked at social comparisons. So there's a lot of um, wearable devices and other apps out there that show you how you do against others. Usually they use leaderboards like something here. You can see that this person in the, in the pink um, is far behind the person who's up in front. And what we often find with leaderboards is that they really motivate um, people around competition, but that they most motivate the people who are at the top of the leaderboard, probably the people who are mo already active before they started, and they demotivate the 95% of people that are at the, re the rest of the leaderboard because they feel like they can't catch up. And so we wanted to test this by comparing different ways of framing social comparisons feedback. So we had about 300 people randomized to four arms here, where again we asked them to form teams of four. Um, and each week they were told that um, at the end of the week they would uh, be eligible for a lottery, um, a one in five chance of winning $35 or a one in a hundred chance of winning $350 each. Um, mathematically, again, $1.40 per day. Um, and uh, well, we, we framed the feedback differently for each group. So in two arms, we didn't give incentives and we told them either how they did compared to the, the average, the 50th percentile feedback, or we told them how they did against the top quartile, the 75th percentile feedback. So how do you do against the norms versus how do you do against something where we're showing you how better people do. And we did this plus and minus incentives. So in the two arms, we did this with incentives. And here's what we found. So in the, the lowest performing arm was actually the 75th percentile arm. You can think of this as the leaderboard arm where we tell you how the really good people are doing. Um, and you get um, uh, feedback that you're far behind. So people were told what their team's average was compared to people, the team's average at the 75th percentile. They met their goal about 27% of the time. But the 50th percentile feedback was a little bit better, but essentially n no different. With incentives, the 75th percentile with incentives was a little bit better, but actually the most significant change was the 50th percentile with incentives. That had about a 67% relative increase. So it really shows us that the way we frame these leaderboards and social comparison feedback has a dramatic impact on our behaviors and that we need to think more carefully about how we design these things before we launch them um, without evidence on whether they work. So taking all of this evidence, um, you know, in, in financial incentives, we began to think about how can we use this in a social context? How can we use this without paying people, but by enhancing the existing relationships that exist within their social network? One study that we have currently uh, going on right now is with the Framingham Heart Study. Framingham Heart Study is a cohort study that's informed a lot of our protocols, especially in the cardiovascular fields, and it's been around for 70 years, but they've never performed a clinical trial. So this is actually the first clinical trial that they're doing. Um, we use a gamification model, which is used widely in the industry, but often doesn't incorporate these insights from behavioral economics. So this is not your typical game where we ask you to do something and you get points for doing it. Uh, we turn this on its head and supercharge it with behavioral economics. So we again ask people to create a team. In this study, it's actually their families. So choose family members that you're related to, and because we're in the Fla Framingham Heart Study, we can selectively target families in this. Um, each of you establishes a baseline and you choose your individual goal. So rather than telling you you should walk 7,000 steps, some people might be higher at baseline, some people might be lower, um, we ask them to choose a step goal increase. We then ask them to sign a pre-commitment pledge. We know that people who commit to their goals are more likely to stick with it. To make this more salient, we put this on their dashboard so anytime they log into the website, they see their commitment that they committed to walk 8,000 steps with their signature on there, so it's a reminder. Instead of giving them points for doing things, we give them the points up front. And we leverage the fresh start effect, which is some work by some colleagues at Wharton that show that people tend to be more motivated for aspirational behavior around temporal, temporal landmarks. So the beginning of the month, your birthday, New Year's. And so what we do is we have everyone start on a Monday. So it's a fresh week, you get a fresh set of 70 points, 10 points for your family for each day of the week. One person from your family is randomly selected to represent the team today. So this could be you, it could be your mother or father, your, your partner, your child. Um, and if that person met their step goal, your family keeps their points. If they don't, the entire family loses 10 points for that day. So you can see how people really become accountable to their family members and families. Many of these families live together and might try to help each other towards achieving their goals. Um, they can progress through levels, as you can see, from bronze to silver to gold to platinum. This gives a level of progression through the game. It uh, also allows from, for some longer term loss aversion. If you get to platinum or gold, um, you really want to stay there because it was hard to get there and you don't want to feel the loss of dropping down. 
Um, just in case you were sitting in a conference like this all day and you had an excuse why you couldn't be active, we gave everybody five lifelines so that you could go on by 5 p.m. and you could um, you know, tag in a family member or friend. It would randomly select someone else from your family to represent you. Um, and that not only helped people with a little bit of forgiveness for when they were sick or just couldn't be active, but also helped you rely on your family members more and enhance those collaborative social incentives. Um, so this study is currently wrapping up. I don't have uh, results to present here, but we're really excited by this work. It looks like a really promising way to help people change behaviors. We're also doing this with uh, weight loss. This is a study at Penn where we asked people to have a family member or friend form a team in a similar intervention. Um, but we added a third arm where we shared the data with your primary care doctor. We did this using the Apple HealthKit integration with Epic, um, where your, your PCP can get the data. Um, to make it more salient, every month we mail a letter to the patient that's addressed to the doctor that shows them um, their, the report that the doctor is getting um, so that the, the individual knows that um, their doctor is getting an update and how they're doing. And the data is still blinded now and in the field, um, so the nine-month study, but we're seeing significant differences w across the arms in the blinded fashion, and so we're hopeful that um, the social incentives are, are a promising way to help people change behavior. And then the third study I'll talk about um, is launching in January. This is funded by the Doris Duke Foundation, um, where we're uh, taking the insights from these two pilot studies and launching a larger trial. The, two, the, study, the example that I described to you is a collaborative social incentive, where teams are working together. Um, but we'd like to compare as collaborative, competitive, and supportive. So different ways to frame the game to enhance these relationships. The idea here is that as opposed to a financial incentive where you give somebody an incentive and then you take it away and oftentimes the behavior dissipates over time, social incentives leverage your existing relationships with your social network so that even when you take the game away, those relationships still remain. You still have your family members and friends that you live with and communicate with. So if we're able to do a good job of enhancing these um, incentives, then we may be able to figure out um, how to sustain them over longer periods. We're doing a bunch of different surveys here, looking at people's <coughs> risk preferences, their, personality sur their personalities at baseline, and interacting them with whether or not they, if they've gotten a supportive, competitive, or collaborative intervention, looking to improve people's A1Cs, weight, and physical activity. So I'll end by talking about a couple specific types of um, uh, other technologies that are target health behaviors. Whenever I give a talk about wearable devices, people are interested in how this might help for other outcomes. Um, people want to know how you could place a bet on your own goal. So there are lots of apps out there. I'm not recommending this app or promoting it, but it is one that does that that's popular. It's called Pact that lets you um, Play, that lets you um, check into your gym membership or strive for goals and you win money from the people that don't achieve their goals. Um, we use a lot of weight, wireless weight scales for our weight loss studies. This allows people to step on their scales in the comfort of their own homes. We actually now do our weigh-ins using FaceTime or Skype as opposed to having people come back into the clinic. Um, we've actually been able to get our adherence to these, the weigh-ins up from about 67% to close to 99% just by spending five minutes uh, FaceTiming with someone and getting them to step on their scale. You can also use another extreme of this. This is the happy fork. This allows you to track how fast or slow you're eating and log your calories. Uh, if you're eating too fast, it, gives, it starts to buzz to nudge you that you're eating too fast because we know that people who eat too fast don't realize they get full and it leads to uh, heartburn and, and eating more calories than you might otherwise do. This is a real product. You can get the, the, the spoon and the knife and the whole set online if you're interested. You can log your calories and then compare how your uh, food eating rate compared to what you're eating and your weight over time. We've used various um, connected pill bottles for medication adherence studies. This is an example of GlowCap. There are also now apps that allow you to be able to just ask people uh, to report whether or not they've um, taken their medicine, and we can use these in, in studies that around similar concepts to help people be more adherent. And then possibly one of my favorite examples is this uh, app called Plant Nanny. Has anybody heard of this app? This is a great example of social incentives. So what the idea here is um, uh, people, you know, we know that if people drink more water, it's better than them for them drinking soda or juices, staying hydrated in some contexts for people with uh, high chances of kid kidney stones and other things um, are really good for you. And so you pick, a, you pick a plant and you log how much water you drink. You can actually now use a connected water bottle that will measure this and, and automatically do it. And if you're drinking a lot of water, your plant will blossom and groom. And you do this with friends, so your friends can see your plant blossoming and, and grow. But if you're, if you're not good about this, you're not drinking enough water, your friends might see your plant looking something like this. <laughs> So you can see how this can be a powerful social incentive if you're able to do this with the right group of individuals um, and it's a clever way to, to try to frame the information to motivate people. 
So with that, in summary, wearable devices can really help us to facilitate the monitoring of health behaviors, but it's important to leverage technology that's designed to reduce sustainable barriers to behavior change. One important key to doing this is not just to rely on these devices by themselves, but to combine them with effective engagement strategies. And these can be done through financial incentives, through workplace wellness programs or insurance programs, like I described, uh, if they appropriately leverage some of the insights from behavioral economics, or it can be done through social incentive programs that could be deployed through communities and possibly be a more scalable way to sustain behavior change over time. Thank you. So I guess I can take questions if anyone has a question. Yeah, so that's a great question. You know, we expect that as time goes on that there'll be a higher adoption rate of smartphones and we will reach more people. But the platform is designed to reach anyone, even if you have a regular cell phone, you know, you can get a text message as your feedback. That's why we don't use apps and things to develop this. We, we, make, we make sure that we can target a wide range of people by using um, these types of technologies. So one example is when we have um, studies with patients with heart attacks, they tend to be an older population and they tend to prefer getting an automated voice call. I don't know any of my friends that would like to get a voice call. People mostly want to get texts that they can acknowledge or not, but the older generation seems more likely to, to want that. Um, one way that we've been trying to in get a more representative sample and then also get people that are less likely to enroll is by thinking about ways to frame the enrollment process. So the typical way to enroll people in a clinical trial is to send them a letter or give them a phone call and ask them if they want to join. It's kind of your opt-in approach. We've been looking at ways to frame opt-out approaches to this. So one example, I have a colleague um, that was doing a diabetes management program where people got um, a letter saying that they were enrolled in a program by their, um, provi by their um, provider and that they had the option to opt out if they wanted, but if not, they'd, be, they'd receive a follow-up phone call to schedule an appointment next week to get their wireless blood pressure cuff and scale. Um, and the other half of the cohort got letters saying, here's a study that you could join if you're interested, the typical approach. They found that they had three times higher enrollment rates in the arm where it was opt-out framing. Done that also with medication adherence after heart attacks where actually we've mailed the pill bottles. It's a little bit more expensive, but actually gets, makes it seem even more like an opt-out approach if you've already got your wearable device in hand or so on. And so these are some of the things that we're trying to test and use these concepts from behavioral economics to get a more sustainable sample and engage people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think insurers are very excited about, you know, the science behind how we could use incentives because so many of them use them and they're popular. Specific to loss aversion, I think that some insurers uh, don't like the idea of the stick approach when you think of carrot and stick. And so one way we've tried to frame this is this, when we put it, when we use the virtual accounts, we don't actually think of that as a stick because you don't lose any money. You only have the opportunity to get money. We think of that as a frozen carrot. So we've given you a reward that thaws over time. If you maintain or adherent, you can do that. Um, now you mentioned one important thing, which is about deploying incentives through premiums. So there, that, there's a lot of challenges with that. So premiums are bundled in with your other health, with your other salary and payments. Um, so a, a $500 um, reward is often dispersed every two weeks and comes out to be $20 a week. Um, so your paycheck may go from 5,000 to 5,020. It's not a big change. You probably don't even see it because it's directly deposited to your bank account. Um, so we've, we've actually done a randomized controlled trial testing premium-based financial incentives for weight loss and found that it wasn't any effective, uh, any more effective than giving people just scales because it's probably buried and hidden. So we really think we need to unbundle these incentives from premiums for them to be more effective.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, when you think about financial incentives, many people get concerned um, that people with low, it could be, you know, the same dollar amount could mean differently to someone who has a higher income versus a lower income. So some of the, some of the ways we've done that in our studies is to try to balance that proportion so that we can test that. Although um, we've done some meta-analyses looking back at cohorts of studies and found that regardless of what your income level is, your age, your um, race, ethnicity, your education, we haven't seen any large and consistent relationships. Now, that being said, most of these studies are not designed to test that. They're designed to test, on average, whether or not you can change behavior. And so these are secondary analyses with a lot of heterogeneity between multiple studies. Um, so some of the larger studies we're doing now, um, we're looking specifically at those types of questions, trying to figure out how we can sample populations from various things. Uh, we're currently doing a, a study now with Humana to look at they have a national program through Vitality Wellness where you can get more rewards for connecting an activity tracker. Um, and this is offered to about 4.5 million people. And we're looking to see amongst those people what proportion of people uh, enroll in these things. And that gives us a sense of who's using an activity tracker and is willing to be incentivized. And then what are the socio-demographics associated with that? And we're finding significant differences. Some of the things that we have just, I've described already, people that are younger are more likely, people with higher incomes are more likely to use like, wearable devices than smartphones and so on. So these disparities do exist. They're not often seen within these smaller clinical trials that are not framed for that but I think are, are an important piece that we need to think about when we're designing future studies, especially these larger cohort studies. Yeah, so there's several different layers. The question was, what, what is the role of the, what does the IRB think, essentially, of these opt-out framing? So there are several different types of opt-out opt -out framing. So in, uh, the most extreme would be an opt-out case where people didn't consent. Um, but that's not the type that we've done in the past. We've done, uh, we are working with the IRB to get there, and, and there are specific areas where that's appropriate and not appropriate. The way we've done this is we've simply framed the information as opt-out. They still fill in informed consent just like uh, everybody else does. So the, the, the examples I described to you, everyone goes through the same consent process, um, but the initial touch point is framed differently as an opt-out. Yeah, so that's an important component. We haven't looked specifically at that. We've been trying to design these interventions to almost mitigate some of that. So the, many of the older approaches were to say, uh, let's take an, let's, let's have, let's roll out an incentive for people to lose, let's say, 10 pounds, and that's probably easier for someone that has a higher weight than someone that has a lower weight. So uh, designing things that are personalized to you, so 5% weight loss for step counts as opposed to setting an arbitrary 10,000 step count, getting a baseline, and then having you choose. By having you choose your goals, you actually take away the blame from the study the, or the insurance company. So what we find is that people who choose their goals um, do so actually irrationally. They choose goals higher than they would rationally expect, and actually on average with what, actually higher than what we would assign to them. And so, but they feel more intrinsically tied to those goals because they chose them. They, they can only hold themselves accountable. Now that's good in that you're intrinsically motivated for that because you chose the goals, but it may be bad if you choose a goal that's too high. So in these initial studies, um, the, the, once you chose a goal, you would stick with it. And some, in the, like the diabetes study I mentioned, every, you can change your goal as long as it's within a span anytime you want, but you choose the goal. We don't choose the goal for you. We just set kind of the expectations around the ranges. Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, I think that there's a couple important elements to that. One is that um, you mentioned the longer term sustainability of these approaches. That's a challenge for all approaches, not just behavioral economic approaches, but we're particularly interested in that. The other thing is that 
we're, by default, we're already in an incentive program. If you have health insurance, you're already getting an incentive. It's just not designed as well as it could be. And so it, it's, it's, I don't think it's accurate to say that we're adding in new incentives that aren't there. We may, may, may be making them more salient or maybe be better targeting them. Um, but certainly I think that there is a balance between whether we use a financial incentive or a social incentive. And we see different strengths in different areas. So you might need a financial incentive to get people over the hump of just engaging. That's a hard level to get into. Just get into the program, get started, and then you may be able to build in social incentives to sustain that over time. I think the evidence thus far has been limited in that it's often a one-size-all approach. It's looking really at what has the optimal effect on average, and we need to think about how do we balance social incentives and financial incentives for long-term sustainability in a more targeted fashion. Yeah, I mean, we've done all kinds of different surveys, looking at self-efficacy, looking at people's stages of change, their self-reported health, their risk preferences, and so on. And thus far, again, these are oftentimes smaller samples, and they're not powered to ask that question. But we've gone back and looked at those things and haven't seen any significant differences. One example, we have a, a, a study uh, that just wrapped up where we're looking at using wireless glucometers and financial incentives in young adults and adolescents with type 1 diabetes. So financial incentives have not been used in much in children in this aspect uh, with connected technologies. And we've looked at people with different self-efficacy in terms of their diabetes management and so on. Um, again, small study, about 90 people, but haven't, haven't seen any dramatic changes there or any interactions with the self-efficacy score at baseline. But I, I think it is an important area that we need to do a deeper dive on in larger studies. All right, thank you.